Okay, well, welcome everyone. My name is Arik Burkowski, and I manage the Russia and Eurasia program here at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. We are delighted to have you join us for our conversation today with two of the most astute and fascinating independent Russian journalists, Olga Churakova and Sonia Goisman, about their struggle with repression by the Russian authorities, their designation as foreign agents, and their popular podcast called Hi, You're a Foreign Agent. This event is titled Russian Independent Journalism and Society Amid the Backdrop of War. And please note that we are being video recorded, courtesy of the Moscow Times. Sonia and Olga will discuss what it's like for independent reporters to be tyrannized by the Russian government and talk about their latest season, Sisters, about how Russia's aggression against Ukraine affects Russian society, especially soldiers' relatives. They will also touch on what the future holds for individuals and organizations, especially independent journalists and media who have been declared foreign agents in Russia. We are pleased to have Sonia with us today in person Olga was unable to get her visa in time to come to the United States for this event, unfortunately, but we are glad that she is able to join us remotely. She is joining us from Kazakhstan, where I understand it is the middle of the night now, uh, and we're also happy to be joined by my colleague, Fletcher visiting scholar, Maxim Krupski, uh, and Alexander Gubsky, who is supporting this event on behalf of the Moscow Times. Welcome. Let me turn it over to Alexander to briefly uh, talk about the event and introduce the panelists. Uh, then we will have Maxim give a brief explanation of Russia's legislation on foreign agents. Then Olga and Sonia will give their presentation. And finally, uh, I might ask a couple of questions from you, Alexander might ask some questions, and then we will turn it over to all of you for questions. So, Alexander, please. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, dear Eric, thank you very much. Dear Fletcher School, thank you very much for, for inviting us. I'm publisher of the Moscow Times, Alexander Gubsky, and uh, we created, uh, this lecture is a uh, continuation of our TMT lecture series. We in the Moscow Times, we also for political refugees. We, we escaped uh, Russia in March 2022 when the war started and when the foreign, uh, when the uh, fake news, uh, uh, fake news uh, law was introduced. Uh, so we moved uh, our team to Amsterdam. Amsterdam is the most liberal city in the world. Whereas uh, Dost, uh, all the previous uh, media outlet also based now, uh, Sonia, sorry, <laughs> so, so, sorry, Sonia, and, and Olga as well, yes. Uh, and um, uh, since the, the beginning of the war, more than a thousand Russian journalists uh, fled countries, and hundreds and thousands of experts and scholars also were forced to uh, to leave. And we, well, in most of the times, we created this idea to uh, to 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 meet uh, best universities uh, and top Russian journalists, top Russian experts, uh, together universities where these journalists, where these experts are based, uh, with a very simple uh, and obvious reason to give uh, their overview what's happened uh, in Russia and around Russia because of the war, and to inform you from uh, uh, what's, uh, what's happened. And so we, we started this project last year, we, 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 we continue this. And Sonia and Olga, they are one of the best Russian journalists, and they are, uh, wa they were one of the first uh, Russian journalists labeled foreign agent. Now more than 150 Russian journalists labeled foreign agents, and around 700, uh, in total, 700 per persons and organizations are labeled. Of course, that's uh, it's uh, later. Maxim will explain how uh, how this status affect. On, on journalists, on freedom of press, on the, well, normal uh, institution. Uh, 
uh, in Russia, uh, but despite on this status, uh, Sonia and Olga, they, they stayed in, uh, in the profession, and now they, well, they run a terrific new project. Lat later they will uh, tell you about that. So again, thank you very much for coming, and I give a, a microphone to, to Maxim to give you a brief overview. Maxim is a famous Russian attorney and uh, defender of uh, uh, human rights activists and journalists. Uh, well, and his uh, his professional is interest is uh, foreign agent and how this uh, this status works and affects uh, Russian uh, Russia and Russian uh, Russian citizens. So Maxim, please. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here and thank you so much for, for having me. Well, um, very briefly, um, the Russian legislation on foreign agents uh, is a great issue for nowadays Russian society. And uh, this legislation has been developing over past 11 years. And during this time, uh, it has been amended in numerous ways. and. Well, the first version of this legislation of 2012 was a challenge to Russian civil society. Nowadays, a uh, version of it is, a, in fact, a natural disaster. And uh, the legal definitions of uh, agency uh, activities have become even more vague. And uh, today, anyone can be labeled a foreign agent without even suspecting that uh, they are acting in the interests of so-called foreign principle. Over the years of uh, implementation of this uh, legislation, hundreds of legal entities and individuals, NGOs, lawyers, journalists, musicians, uh, scientists, uh, and simply public figures openly criticizing the Russian authorities, uh, have been added to this register. Um, and a real wave of, uh, I call it like, agentomania uh, swept over the Russian authorities against uh, the, the backdrop of uh, full-scale invasion of Ukraine, obviously. Despite the constant appeal to the need to ensure transparency uh, in the activities of so-called foreign agents and protect national interests, as well as statements about the harmless and non-discriminatory nature of law, the real meaning of uh, Russian legislation on foreign agents is the desire to cleanse public space of any signs of independent civic activity and to stigmatize the very notion of an alternative viewpoint of what is going on in Russia and to establish a monopoly uh, on uh, the information agenda. Um, the official authorities, by the way, make no secret of their openly hostile attitude towards foreign agents. For example, deputies of the State Duma publicly call them a foreign contagion and propose a complete ban on their activities in Russia. Foreign agents who have left Russia are proposed to be deprived of their property, and those who remain are proposed um, to be deprived of the right to receive any funding, so uh, any sources of income. Um, it means their means of subsistence. Uh, Minister of Justice Konstantin Chuchenko, speaking at the International Legal Forum in May this year, proposed to extend uh, the law on foreign agents to the protection of spiritual and moral values. Well, apparently, the next step will be to use, I don't know, uh, silver bullets and uh, garlic against foreign agents or something like that. And a few months ago, new amendments were introduced to the law on foreign agents providing for liability for assisting foreign agents in violation of Russian law. Given the nature of the implementation of the law on foreign agents, this norm will f further discourage people from cooperating with foreign agents. And of course, two weeks ago, uh, it was a, a really a tough situation. Everyone was shocked by the news of the arrest of uh, Radio Freedom journalist Alsu Kormashova in, uh, in, in, in Russia uh, on charges of failing to comply with the law on foreign agents and failing to submit an application to the Ministry of Justice 
for inclusion her in the register of foreign agents. And according to the Russian authorities, Kromashova should have registered as a foreign agent because she collected information of military nature as a part of her journalist work. Um, she faces up to five years in prison. The case of Alsu Kurmashova is a new chapter in the history of development of foreign agent legislation. And this repressive mechanism, in fact, quasi-legal tool, in general and against independent journalists in particular. And I'm very glad that today we all have an opportunity to give a word uh, to the journalists themselves uh, who have experienced the impact of this law and to understand what does it mean when uh, Russian authorities tell you, hi, so now you are a foreign agent. So, so thank you so much for this opportunity. It's, thank you. Give this word to you. So thank you, Maxime, for your excellent explanation of the context that Sonia and Olga are dealing with. And now I will turn it over to you for your presentation. Yeah, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I know it's dark, it's cold, it's midterm time. It's like, it's, it's far from Harvard because I see Harvard people here. So thank you so much for coming. Uh, me and Ola, really, we appreciate it. So I think Ola will start uh, our uh, intro, I would say, like, and we just uh, uh, tell you more about who we are and what we do at journalism. Hi everyone, um, uh, it's a great honor to speak with you and I'm really sorry and I'm really sad that I can be with all of you um, in Boston. I really miss Boston and unfortunately my passport is still in, in embassy so um, I hope this anti-human image not prevent us to have some a good discussion about Russian journalist, journalism uh, today. Um, yeah, really sorry, and uh, my speech could be a little bit messy, sorry for that too, because it's 4 a.m. at the morning in Kazakhstan, um, so good morning everyone. Um, I have been working, and few words, um, I want to start with few words about uh, my career, so you um, you could understand what actually I did and uh, what question could I answer it uh, and so on. I have been working in independent media in Russia for more than um, 10 years and my initial focus was domestic politics and then I switched to anti-corruption investigation. I started as a journalist at Novaya Gazeta and then I worked for one of the best business newspapers such as Commerzan and Vedomosti where, where I actually met Alexander and he was my editor <laughs> and now we are a panelist <laughs> together in exile. Um, in recent years, I have worked for the best Russian investigative outlets such as Project, uh, Project and iStories. And we also made a lot of collaboration with international media, for example, OCCRP, Daily Beasts and others. And we mainly deal with the stories that revealed the corruption of Putin's officials, his family, friends and assets. And I have also personally covered protests, including the Belarus protest in 2019, work of Wagner PMC and Evgeny Prigozhin, and for the first six months of the war, I worked on stories about the military operations, refugees, and Russian businessmen who businessmen who continue to do business abroad despite sanctions. Sanction. And last year, I spent time at Harvard as a Neiman Fellow. And um, yeah, had some fun there. <laughs> um, and now I'm a co-host of the podcast, Hi, You're a Foreign Agent, uh, which is the reason why I'm here today with you guys. Sonia? Uh, yes, I think it's just important uh, to understand that Ola literally was like one of the most uh, favorite, one of the favorite uh, journalists for, I don't know, Russian State Duma deputies. 
So, and she was allowed, I don't know, to speak to like the highest uh, politicians in the country. And then happened what has happened. Uh, so yeah, uh, I come from a very completely uh, completely different field. Uh, if Ola was originally a newspaper journalist, I was a TV reporter and a documentary director. And most of my career, I spent at TV Rain. Some Niemans already uh, saw this screenshot, <laughs> and um, yeah, because. Uh, uh, I spent there most of my uh, career, and it is a uh, Russian um, last independent uh, TV channel. Uh, now it also works in exile and broadcasts mostly on YouTube. And um, uh, this is my favorite type of work, which I cannot do, unfortunately, uh, now. I do long-form documentaries, uh, and if I say long-form, it means like one hour length like full uh, documentaries. And um, uh, I uh, usually focus on um, Russian crackdown on dissent and, um, and, Russian, and pe Russian like people's resistance uh, to it. And um, like my approach, I believe that every national story can be told through one's person's story. Um, so, uh, a few years ago, I left TV Rain, as it turned out uh, temporarily, uh, for the project, and uh, we, where we worked uh, together with Olya, and uh, I was uh, re responsible for all our video investigations, and made my own films as well, and also there I started doing podcasts. Uh, it was, uh, I would say, wonderful and very interesting time uh, being uh, um, in a startup, uh, a journalistic startup. I think all of it will tell a little bit more about project. Yeah, a few words, literally. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we were all like a badass, if I, I allow to say this in the university. Uh, back then, the project in 2019-2021 uh, wanted to become a Russian Republica. And our editor demanded from each story to become a hit. Like, uh, it's supposed to be a real, very loud story about whatever, something with Putin. And uh, this work, I have to admit, was quite stressful for everyone. Uh, because, for example, our editor didn't even register the media in Russia because he believed that it was pointless uh, already in 2019. And we didn't have an office because police could come to the office with a search. And for our editor, the personal goal of the work was the entire Putin gang, as he called it. And the pressure uh, on us personally began to feel immediately in a completely different way uh, these years. So this is uh, June 28, 20, uh, 21st year. On this day, our chief editor and uh, two journalists were searched in their apartments and the police confiscated all the equipment, opened a criminal case. And uh, then the same evening, we met uh, all together to, you know, exhale, exhale and uh, uh, to take this photo and to have some drinks. And we posted it on social media with captions and uh, the words were, it won't happen. You did not get what you want. Like we meant uh, that the Russian officials uh, uh, will not close us. So uh, our editor flew out the country first. And uh, two weeks later, project was declared undesirable organization in Russia, which meant the end of everything. So they, <laughs> they got what they wanted. And um, it became the first media with such status and is journalist uh, and among the for, uh, became among the first foreign agents and Ola first was among of them because I at first wasn't. Um, yeah, um, in 2018 as a, a Russian state Duma correspondent, I wrote an article about the Russian government uh, taking legislation on foreign agents and you could see the cover of this. Uh, it's our with Alexander newspaper. 
uh, not our, but the newspaper that, that we work for. Uh, in uh, 2021, I became a foreign agent myself due to these changes in legislation. And uh, back then I had worked for project for nearly three years. And all of us in 2018 thought that this legislation um, will be about uh, bloggers, Navalny, politicians, and not only about not only not about journalists so we, it was a mistake yeah so uh the week after it, it happened to Olya, it happened uh to me already unemployed i left for the south of russia to somehow recover and uh, return to moscow uh, still unemployed uh, but now carrying out the functions of me a media outlet designated a foreign agent and this was my first post on social media after I got this status. And because you have to post this stupid, humiliating 24 words disclaimer, disclaimer uh, on your every post. And uh, I called Olya because she was experienced for an agent uh, already. And I was crying, literally crying, because like it was unclear for me uh, what to do. And uh, on the very first day when I called her from uh, this beach uh, in the city of Sochi, um, we decided uh, to make a podcast to figure out, like, what the heck does it mean to be a foreign agent? I'm sorry, uh, we are still in a university. But yes, it was ridiculous and we didn't know what to do. So honestly, uh, we at that uh, point didn't understand what uh, all this meant uh, even ourselves as journalists even if we did these uh, uh, articles about it um yeah so what does this status mean to us uh i remember that um i was absolutely frustrated about everything and uh, one of a uh, guy uh, who I really liked asked me what 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 does this mean to you like it's it's just a status it's nothing and I remember that the first episodes I literally in my head I tried to answering this question to this guy that it's not nothing it's actually about my job my future uh, that I now I didn't have it at all in my country so first of all, you are forced to waste time on nonsense uh, instead of work. And you must report all of your income and expense. And you, you have to spend money on reports and bookkeeping and special forms. And of course, this 24 character disclaimer in, you can see it uh, on Sonia's present slides. Uh, it's like 24 character disclaimer and uh, it literally says that you are an enemy and uh, you're supposed to be a UFO an agent and people shouldn't, shouldn't uh, believe in everything that you post. It, it, like you can post cats and it's still you, it's still cats yeah. with this disclaimer. Uh, basically, you could live with that, it's true, uh, as long as you keep silent about everything uh, in politician, uh, in, in politics, in society, in, in everything. And, <clears throat> of course, everyone two years ago was afraid to employ us because we were actually first who got this status. And it was also important because we... Uh, we felt uh, very lonely in this uh, situation and everybody was like, oh, it's not going to happen with us. And um, so we, we all um, made these mistakes, thinking that it's not about us. Yeah, this is me and uh, uh, my post on Instagram. Thank you, Sonia. <laughs> um, so... This means that, uh, like a, uh, this means that we journalists who simply do our job uh, well uh, all the time now we are bad, and uh, people should know that we are spies and that we do not deserve trust. And just like that, we turn from successful uh, young professionals to unemployed state enemies and outlaw completely outlaw. Uh, the most idiotic part of this is that uh, this is a permanent status and we had a choice uh, to leave in 2021. 
and most of the people and uh, most of the people from our team uh, and most of the people on this list uh, with foreign agents, they uh, almost immediately left the country because of this risk of going to jail for any mistake in the report or for not making their social media posts or for not writing this uh, stupid disclaimer. And this risk was already very high for us, but we decided to stay um, at least for a while. And uh, then we called our reality show, Hi, Your Foreign Agent. Uh, and uh, you could see us, It's I think it's our third or something like that episode. And uh, it calls uh, Hi, Your Foreign Agent. And it sounds a little bit weird probably in English, but it's actually uh, rhythms in Russian. And um, we thought that, okay, you took our job away, but we can create our own media, make a change and push back. Uh, it, it also was a little bit stupid, you know, like I think uh, uh, we, we did all of this, this because of adrenaline uh, and because of we desperate wanted to, uh, to, 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 to work and to continue our job. Uh, and also we thought that it would be one or two episodes of, a, of this, like, like it would be our form of therapy. And unexpectedly, the content about the new enemies of the people was met with great support from our listeners, readers, and we began to talk more and more, and we began to talk about how we couldn't find a job, how we had to put this disclaimer even on Tinder, uh, how we were suing the Ministry of Justice. Okay. In general, uh, super unexpectedly, we started making fun of all of, of, all, all of it, sorry, as much as we could. And uh, when I was at Harvard last year, I took a course about humor, and it was an incredibly uh, smart and funny and uh, very interesting course. And now I know uh, that humor helped actually to deal with the trauma. So we didn't know that, but I think we assumed something like that. I think most of Russians know that humor helps with trauma, like because of anecdotes, memes. Uh, this is like our idea. Yeah, this is a Russian legacy, I think. Um, but it's also in existing years. And uh, also uh, we discussed our professional challenges and the problems faced by other journalists in the same situation. And podcast helped us a lot. It has been featured in thousands of leading Russian international media outlets, including New York Times, New Yorker, Guardian, Times, BBC, NPR, and many others. Uh, it started to feel, feel a little bit weird, actually. And Sonia will tell why. Uh, you know, because as a journalist, uh, we are not uh, used to be in front of the camera, we would prefer to be uh, from behind of it and to tell other people's stories instead of telling our story and uh, uh, being how they call us the victims of putting crack down on the press. And uh, like, yeah, mo 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 most common word here is uh, crack down. Yeah, I even uh, uh, stood a solitary, solitary, pro solitary protest just, you know, because like no one cared that it's happening with journalism. Like, yes, we did this podcast. It was featured uh, in many foreign uh, outlets, uh, uh, but still like society didn't care about like a group of uh, Russian independent journalists uh, uh, who were labeled foreign agent and whose work uh, became uh, illegal at some point. We have like another problems. So yeah, you have to protest for yourself alone and become sort of an activist, which we did not want to. And um, mm, we didn't feel comfortable uh, in this role. And um, at the end, you know, it was all very, very unpleasant because, of course, you can make jokes about it. You can uh, say that, oh, they're stupid jerks, uh, everyone who invented it. Uh, but uh, what kind of a foreign agent uh, am I? In the course of my life, 
uh, I've learned about Russia, like I'm from Novosibirsk, I'm from Siberia, and I know about Russia and its people uh, thanks to like constantly traveling uh, to the country and uh, assignments. Uh, um, I, I know more uh, than most of the deputies in the State Duma uh, who voted for this law. Um, so to tell other people's stories, but not mine story, my story, uh, in the beginning of uh, 2022, I rejoined uh, Tiverine, uh, which also was already a foreign agent, uh, so they weren't afraid of uh, in, <laughs> inviting uh, me and uh, giving me a job. And uh, the last documentary, uh, oh, hmm, interesting. Uh, okay, <laughs> and <laughs> and the last documentary I made was weeks uh, before the war. Uh, I was interviewing people in small towns near uh, the Russian-Ukrainian border, and nobody, including myself, believed uh, a war w would break out. There I met a Russian soldier who told me that he would fight if Vova, Putin, told him so, even though he didn't think of Ukrainians as enemies. And uh, at that moment, Ola was also uh, doing some reports from uh, the Russian-Ukrainian border for another publication, and we shared uh, our experiences and we were like, how, how can it, like, how can it happen? And uh, then on February 24, um, Russia fully invaded Ukraine, and uh, it became clear uh, what uh, uh, the press repression uh, was leading up to. So we learned that Russian authorities were preparing for war. And that's why our uh, publication was labeled as undesirable. That's why we were labeled as foreign agents. Uh, they wanted us uh, to be silent, uh, not being able to spread the truth information. Tr uh, um, trustful information about what was happening then and now. And um, um, within a week, uh, TV Rain and nearly all Russian independent media uh, was shut down. And facing the threat of prison, I packed my carry-on and left Russia in a few hours. And uh, so did Olya. And uh, at, the say, uh, 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 at that moment, uh, it became clear that we could no longer, you know, be a podcast about the lives of foreign agents because we became jobless again. I personally, Olya, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> had a job uh, at that moment at another outlet. Uh, but of course, we wanted uh, uh, to keep doing our podcast. But uh, uh, a much worse reality was yet to come. And uh, we found ourselves uh, in a huge crisis. So since we lost to propaganda, if so many people support war, what did we run as journalists? And uh, we began discussing uh, uh, this with other fellow journalists in our episodes and uh, searching for renewed uh, uh, sense of purpose in our profession and then we decided to shift focus uh, um, to the stories of people who resist uh, the war in Russia to give them voice uh, because this was very important because we constantly uh, were uh, hearing these questions why Russians don't protest against it all. They do, but their voices are not that loud uh, as everyone would prefer. I would say. And we tried uh, uh, to make sense of all this situation and maybe even be helpful. And uh, like, I'm proud that uh, with our podcast, we helped to fundraise thousands of uh, dollars uh, for refugees uh, because we left links um, in our episodes and uh, people donated. And then we heard from uh, people who they donated to that, yes, thanks for your work and thanks for stories. Uh, we could like uh, buy a lot of things for Ukrainian refugees uh, who eventually came uh, to Russia. And uh, um, of course, by doing our work, I think we supported uh, listeners and viewers later, because today Russian journalism uh, is largely about the therapy. Uh, because um, 
um, people want to understand, like they need uh, to understand, no matter what propaganda says, you are not alone. There are others like you. And we saw our goal in doing it as well. And uh, here is an example. Uh, 61 year old stalker from Vologdam, Vladimir Rumantsev. Uh, he is on this picture. And he created an underground radio station and started airing anti war broadcasts. And uh, so we were like, wow, he's, he, 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 he's our colleague. He's like a podcaster. <laughs> uh, but in a very, uh, like, <laughs> not ancient way, but like, <laughs> in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a in a not that modern way, and uh, he became a first uh, person in his city to be charged uh, under the article for spreading fake news about Russian army because of his uh, radio station, which wasn't like I'm not sure if anyone had listened to it, and uh, he received three years uh, in a colony, and uh, we told his story. And uh, the story of his life uh, uh, was a story, you know, of life and uh, personal resistance of a very lonely but free man. And uh, this podcast uh, grew out of uh, a documentary film I was shooting for TV Rain. Yes, in July, TV Rain relaunched uh, uh, from Latvia. And uh, now it's broadcasting on YouTube for millions of Russian. Mm. Not only Russian, like four millions of people in Russia and Ukraine in other countries uh, where people understand uh, this language. Um, so I cannot go to Russia and report like many other. Um, and uh, I, uh, this film about uh, anti-war Russians, including uh, uh, Vladimir Romansov, a stalker from Vologda. Uh, I filmed uh, uh, from uh, my uh, studio in Riga, like sitting uh, at home. And uh, everything uh, was made remotely, but I'm not sure that you will notice if we, you will watch. Um, so. Because uh, uh, having no way to work in field uh, uh, forced me to be very, very inventive. And uh, I had sometimes uh, hire wedding photographers to shoot interview and to direct them over uh, the phone without being able to see anything and just having a hope <laughs> that they will do their job. And uh, um, this... Uh, is a very, like, another, you know, tragic comedic story about how it, it all is done under and under what conditions, uh, but another time, because, like, it can be a one hour lecture about how we work. Uh, so, nevertheless, over the past uh, year, I managed to make films about people in Russia who are persecuted uh, for the anti war stance and about those who said, even who even uh, set fire on fire uh, to military recru recruitment offices, and about deportations uh, of Ukrainian children, about ref refugees, and uh, uh, many issues all from uh, exile. And because real Russia seems very untold country today, and um, of course. Working in exile is not only hard because of like technical issues, but also I would say adaptive ones, <laughs> uh, because like it seems like no one, including uh, my boss, uh, uh, have has no idea what does it mean to be like Russian journalism in exile, and that's why maybe I'm here. Uh, at Harvard, at Neiman, just trying to figure out how it all uh, should look like. And uh, But speaking of podcasts, uh, they are very convenient uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, exile uh, because we can do large-scale journalism in this format. And uh, this is one of the few mediums uh, which are not yet controlled by Russian authorities. And we can do this without vetting, photo vetting videographers and uh, from uh, any point of the world because our 
team is uh, scattered. And uh, speaking of the podcast again, oh, this is like how we usually work uh, on the uh, reports. There is a, a videographer, uh, there is a, a person who I'm interviewing, and this is me sitting at my home. <laughs> Um, I was uh, already ready uh, to go to like uh, some like to Harvard maybe soon and was, uh, wasn't uh, <laughs> uh, planning uh, uh, maybe to work on another huge uh, story but in the February of this year I received a message uh, from a listener of our podcast and uh, it resembled uh, more of a confession. Uh, she wrote that her brother disappeared in the summer and she suspects that he went to work as a mercenary in a private military company, Wagner. Uh, she's against the war and for her it, this was catastrophe. And uh, at the same time, she has no one to talk about it. And uh, there are no communities of anti-war sisters whose brothers are war criminals. It's like it's a shame for them. And uh, we talked to her with uh, Ola, and then for a long time, we couldn't get over that conversation. Her brother indeed turned out to be a mercenary for Wagner, and she took an extremely risky step. She recorded several con conversations with him after he returned uh, from the war and shared them with us. What we heard was completely shocking. And later, we changed his voice and used it in our podcast because we believe in a public interest. And uh, yeah, th but this is not the only episode. Yeah, and I knew another girl who, whose brother had gone to war. Um, and we understood that it's not, on, it's not about one episode, it's something bigger. And we needed to make a whole season out of this. And we decided to call it Sisters. Um, the whole season delves into the families of Russians who have gone to war with Ukraine and explores what awaits them um, and the, all of uh, us upon their return. Mm -hmm. The main uh, protagonists of the investigation are Russian women opposing the war, in which their brothers have chosen to participate in, uh, in Wagner as volunteers or through mobilizations because of money, because they are bored or whatever. And I would say that for me, it turns out that this podcast uh, about the complexity of the life of life and about the real state uh, of society and also about families and what they are going through right now. How can sisterly and civil coexist? How does war change people? And what are the consequences that we can observe right now? And how is the Russian state dealing with them? Uh, all these questions we're trying to ask, we're trying to answer it in this podcast. And by the way, the illustrations that you could see were created uh, by contemporary artist Anna Samoylova. Now she's based in London. And she read me a project when I was at the Belarusian protest in Minsk. And um, she offered a collaboration. And since then, we decided to collaborate with her um uh she used a folklore it's a some kind of uh russian fairy tale about three brothers and three sisters and this one is a scary one uh because it's all about soldiers and war uh into which children in russia are introduced from childhood i believe because i myself was also raised with this sense of war it was Chechnya, uh, it was uh, Afghanistan, and now it's Ukraine. The color red is uh, shown in, uh, into our history and has great significance. And now, of course, it's the color of blood, vulnerability, uh, bonds, and, of course, Soviet heritage. The childhood of the heroes is so similar, yet their lives become so different as they grew up. I quoted Tanya uh, in this, and... For examples, uh, for example, besides the story of the sister and her brother uh, who worked for Wagner, 
two episodes of this podcast are dedicated to the story of Masha. You can see uh, illustration of uh, her episodes. Masha and her co cousin Kolya, uh, na all names, uh, we changed all names. And Kolya decided to be a volunteer for uh, for the war and was severely wounded. And he decided to go, uh, to, go to the war because he was bored. Uh, he grew up in a small Russian city. And <clears throat> he decided to go to the war because it it's probably could be something more interesting as he thought. And Masha tried to talk him out of going, uh, but he didn't believe uh, at all that uh, he, he shouldn't do this. Uh, and of course, uh, he was bounded. Uh, and after after he realized that it's not so fun as he thought, uh, he attempted to get discharged from service. But because of mobilization, he was sent back to the front. And when he uh, came home from the war, he became aggressive. Uh, he started to drink uh, all the time, got drunk all the time. And afterwards, he actually killed his grandmother in front of his mother. And this is like a really tragedy. Uh, and Masha faced this tragedy. And uh, in all, uh, all these episodes, she trying to understand how it could happen she trying to reflect it on that in, and he trying to forgive herself, himself. And I think it's a, it's a very important to listen to that because we try to write it down, but it's not the same um, when you hear it. And unfortunately, it's so far only in Russian, but we are currently working on uh, how to translate it in English. Uh, and in this podcast, you can hear a lot of uh, reflections like that, because uh, what what to do with your life and what to do with your family when when inside this family is such a big tragedy happening, and you don't don't understand how to deal with that. Uh, other our sister Karina also had this conflict. She has been working with veterans of the Chechen wars, suffering from PTSD from the last few years and despising war. And a year ago, her own brother was also drafted. And th and this story uh, will be continued in the future episodes. And um, she also trying to help right now to other soldiers, even she against war and she 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 didn't su support it at all, but she trying to work with them as a psychologist. Sonia. Um, yeah, but like I don't want to give you any spoilers, but I think but this story will also turn to the tragedy unfortunately and we didn't expect any of it when we started recording and started talking with these sisters we were like okay we, we just wanted to hear sisters and then the reality uh, came and um, everything uh, became like a true like we didn't uh, intend to do the true crime podcast you know it was just like a podcast about uh, the re like reality we or are going to face very soon after these thousands thousands of soldiers uh, will come uh, to their families and um, in the beginning uh, uh, of the war we made uh, episodes about disputes and conflicts within families uh, due to the different positions uh, on the war but this is uh, about a very, you know, new level of existential crisis uh, that like people in these families face with. And uh, so, yes, six episodes are already released, uh, but uh, yes, yeah, several more are ahead. And uh, we observed these families uh, um, uh, within more than a half of uh, uh, a year. And uh, it seemed uh, seems that we managed uh, to capture the spirit of the times, and um, uh, without trying to simplify it, and without any kind of propaganda. And 
because like in general uh, we found it very 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 important today uh, to tell such complex and uh, non-black and white uh, stories uh, and it seems like this is our advantage of uh, being Russian-speaking journalists uh, uh, because we still um, I'm not sure how long it will last because we are in exile, but we still can um, understand uh, the country, the reality, and able to distinguish some nuances. Um, so in this way, we try to reach a wider audience, uh, and maybe it will persuade uh, someone not to go to war, I don't know, or at least uh, uh, we can be able uh, to document war crimes as in the case with the Wagner uh, mercenary. Because I think it's like the second uh, goal of Russian journalism today, like first a therapy, <laughs> second one is just to document the reality, document war crimes, document what is uh, happening, what people say, and then maybe uh, when we come closer s to some sort of recognition and acknowledgement, uh, maybe uh, it uh, will be useful. and. Um, Mm, maybe we also can just support those who have uh, the civil war in their families. Uh, to understand that our work turned out well, and uh, um, there is one fact. Uh, our podcast has already been uh, banned by the Russian officials uh, on the Russian hosting service Yandex, and um, so has been our website. And uh, uh, we were accused of spreading false information and threatening the country. This is like the quote. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, as Ola said, it's, it's in Russian, so, uh, but we are, like, our colleagues uh, uh, have translated a uh, part of the episodes uh, uh, for other publications, uh, and it can be even listened on YouTube with subtitles, but I'm not sure it's an inconvenient option. So, yeah, we are still uh, in uh, um, search of collaborations, uh, but I hope that uh, who those who are interested can be like listen uh, to it soon. So overall, do you wanna like sum up? Uh, I think I'm ready uh, for when the session <laughs> we can turn it on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, that was uh, a fascinating presentation about your uh, incredible work and Olga's incredible work in a very difficult media environment in Russia. So I want to ask you a question. I will ask one question of Maxim, and then we will uh, open it up to uh, all of you. So you mentioned that some of your stories you are able to get through your listeners. And I want to ask you to tell us a bit more about who listens to your podcast. Over the last 20 months, we've seen Russian society become accustomed or indifferent to living amid the backdrop of war. And we understand that the Russian population at least appears to be largely apathetic, perhaps politically demobilized. You mentioned that very few Russians are going out to protest. And we also know that most Russians uh, get their information from government propaganda, especially television channels. How are independent Russian journalists, especially those like you who are in exile today, able to break through that media censorship and try to win hearts and minds in Russia. Do you have a good sense of who your audience is and how do they feel about the invasion of Ukraine? Thank you so much for your question. Uh, we also, oh, thank you. Thank you so much for your question. We also, you know, uh, ask uh, ourselves uh, how to break through uh, this, uh, um, wall 
uh, which uh, uh, Russian uh, government uh, tries uh, to put between the real information uh, and uh, uh, its people. But at the same time, uh, speaking of our audience, uh, I should mention that podcasts are not that huge as, uh, for example, in the United States and Russian. So it's a very, very, like, you know, like the best uh, audience uh, that can be because like this is a people uh, who are very familiar with all these technical innovations such as podcast platforms and uh, uh, who usually listen to other podcasts uh, so I think it's like we did we did um, uh, a survey uh, trying uh, to uh, learn more about our audience uh, uh, so it is very like I would say it's intelligentsia right it's like um, of course uh, media workers and journalists but not only it's also uh, students uh, uh, university scholars uh, uh, it is uh, IT guys um, cultural and arts and cultural workers and of course there are a lot of like I would say um, not like uh, people from intelligentsia who listen to our podcast because uh, they are um, simply care about what is happening. And uh, I personally am a huge advocate of people uh, who try to resist uh, to what is happening because uh, I usually notice that um, those people who like I mean who ask for um, Russians uh, to be more active in terms of protests haven't ever lived in authoritarian countries under authoritarian regimes and it's of course very important that like Russian people live under this regime like for last 30 years and that uh, they had only I don't know five years of freedom like uh, of uh, um, some like institutions that were trying to be built and then it all collapsed uh, and we have what we have and before uh, they had like this huge trauma of uh, um, Soviet times um, 70 years so like overall it's like 100 years of oppression and uh, not oppression, but like repressions, uh, and um, very, very few value of um, individuals' lives. Um, so, but uh, even in this uh, environment, there are a lot of people. Because, for example, TV Rain, uh, it is easier to say about TV Rain, for example, because it has uh, wider statistics. Uh, is watched uh, uh, by 20 million viewers uh, uh, each month and uh, uh, at least 60% of these people are in Russia. So we can see that there are like millions of people who really want uh, to know to like uh, some real information. But of course, it's like this why I'm here in Harvard. I really wanna <laughs> wanna know how to break through this um, um, wall and uh, uh, how to beat propaganda. Because of course, we were very very frustrated uh, in the first month of the war when like we realized that we lost to propaganda, that people believed in it. But still, there are people uh, whom we don't want uh, to leave uh, alone with propaganda. Maybe Ola wants to add something. Yeah, just to add to this point, I think uh, it's a very uh, painful question for us in terms of um, we were banned uh, this week. And uh, of course, it's not only the question of uh, like who is this listener, but also how they can listen to us, actually, because um, for now, we, we still have YouTube and other uh, services through you, you can listen to us. But uh, who knows what what would be after a week, after a month, after a year, and it's uh, it's a very um, you should to create something, you should to invent VPN, you should constantly think about this, and of course it's uh, it's another pain in our head. Uh, how to make sure that uh, it's actually 
uh, will be in Russia because a big part of my friends they 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 lived outside unfortunately because of the the war situation and all of that. But it's super important for us that we have listeners in Russia, and this is like a half of our audience. And we worried about how they like. Uh, whether they can listen to us or not, and uh, we we should to think about the access to 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 our podcast, of course. Thank you both, Alexander. Did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I'd like to remark because uh, w when we ask uh, you ask ourselves, we ask ourselves uh, wh why Russians so about uh, not critical to propaganda. The question, uh, the answer is resources. Uh, federal state media and uh, independent Russian media, which in fact uh, fully controlled, I mean independent like Gazprom media or National Media Group or Yandex of Kontakte, uh, which are independent, but in fact they are fully controlled by, uh, by Kremlin, their total budget on the federal media is about $10 billion. Uh, our uh, uh, combined budget, 31 media in exile last year was $6 million. Six million versus ten billions. This is how we are fighting, and this is all the resources for media. Then, girls were just uh, banned, yes, blocked, uh, blocked in Russia. We are also fighting because it's not only war; it's not only information war; it's also a cyber war. So we are fighting against the whole state, against thousands of engineers of Roskomnadzor. They are really clever now. They they and they have enormous resources. Uh, we as at the Moscow Times, they started to block us. Uh, we was blocked for the first time in April, 2022. Then they blocked. Of course, we built new mirror, new mirror, new mirror. They started to, to block us every month, then every week. Now it's almost every day. So uh, unfortunately, uh, th this uh, this also works. So, but we are creative. Of course, our resources much uh, much smaller, uh, but we are creative. Well, uh, well, we, we are fighting, and uh, definitely we will we will win because the the, the truth is on our side. Uh, but it's 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 really it's really difficult and tough. But definitely, uh, all uh, for all Russian media in exile. Of course, our main goal is to bring truth to Russia. Thank you. So, uh, you all are welcome to prepare your questions. We have a microphone here, and uh, when you raise your hand, please wait for the microphone to get to you. And I want to remind you that uh, this event is being recorded. But one final question from me for Maxime. Uh, can you talk a bit about the future of uh, how uh, Russia's foreign agents legislation will impact the media environment? You mentioned this unprecedented case of Alsu Kurmasheva, the Russian-American uh, journalist from Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, who was recently detained in Russia for failing to register as a foreign agent. What is your assessment of the implications of her case, not only for uh, Russia's media landscape, but also for foreign journalists perhaps coming to Russia? What does this all mean? Yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for this great presentation. It's quite impressive, really. Uh, you're, you're doing great work, I think, and in, in times of war and in, in times of uh, so-called post-through world, you give people a chance to uh, like know something from the first hands, and it's quite important. It's uh, really great work. About foreign agents, again, foreign agents legislation uh, is the key mechanism of undermining the trust in terms of journalistic work and for journalists is the key feature the key principle to be trusted in fact the trust is like the, the main the main need for for journalists and uh, to uh, through the extent that uh, um, foreign agent legislation undermines this uh, this trust of course it hurts journalistic work and the the main idea of uh, of this mechanism is in fact quite simple because the the main goal of of russian state of uh, putin's regime is to keep this status quo the status quo of civic and political 
inactivity, civic and political apathy. This is the 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 the, the like I don't know the the main treasure, in fact, of Putin's regime because the beating heart of of Putin's regime is not, you know, unity of nation, rally around flag or something like that. The beating heart is like civic and political apathy and they will try to do everything they can just to keep this this status quo and that's why they can uh, they, they they like you know the the uh, russian population cannot be allowed to think for itself so it's 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 impossible um for um for, for uh, uh, russian authorities today so that's why of course they use such mechanisms such dirty game against independent journalism like for example what 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 can they do in fact ban a resource that's it they are not creative um persons they are not they they in fact they cannot build anything they know how to destroy something it's like kgb style it's it's not about like creating something independent journalists yeah, are creating something and and those guys they they know how to how to disintegrate something and this is the key source of their power by the way so that's why i think that such legislation like foreign agent legislation and uh, new amendments and uh, new implementation like for example in in, in case of al um, of, of this legislation are our uh, unfortunately our potential future and yes we have quite little resources as a uh, civil society or parts or pieces of the civil society but you have to do this to try to find this ties, this connection with, uh, first of all, with Russian people, because this is their and our, as Russians, responsibility to do something with that. So, and, and how can we do that? How can we change something just through understanding and through readiness to be responsible for, uh, at least for knowing the truth? And again, that's why I think you're doing this great job. So this is my short answer, yeah. Thank you, Maxime. Thank you. Questions? Yes, over uh, there. Um, yeah, while well, microphone is coming, uh, Sonia and Ole, I have one question uh, to you. Um, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with this uh, foreign agent legislation, but one of the hook that all foreign agent in Russia, they have to report to Ministry of Justice not only about their income, but also about their expense, uh, about their spendings, all spendings, because it's so unclear that it seems that you have to report to all your spendings, uh, toothbrush, uh, well, and etc., uh, etc., etc. Et uh, my question to you: Do you still continue to report? I still continue this report uh, and the reason why I'm doing this because I want, if they want to see me as a criminal, I want them to do uh, this with their own hands. And uh, um, it's it's a, like a weird maybe uh, decision, but um, I still have family in Russia. I still have my mom there. I still have my relatives and I also, uh, in my heart and in my mind, I also worried about if something happens with them and I won't be able to go back. And uh, maybe it's already like that. Uh, like Maxim mentioned, uh, Alsu, uh, who returned to Russia and was arrested immediately. And maybe the same things happened with me, but uh, if I could prevent this uh just to submit uh, this stupid report, I'll probably uh, continue to do it. I don't know, maybe maybe for a while. Uh, I Yeah, just to want to build up on it. Um, like I have same situation, but you know, being very perfectionists uh, in uh, other fields of our life, uh, we do most of our work very properly but these reports are the work which we do very very yeah. 
So yeah, this is this is the work we do very poorly. Uh, <laughs> we <laughs> we <laughs> we are not trying uh, to be excellent students, excellent foreign agents. No, we are like the worst, I would say. So we do it, but. <laughs> uh, I'm constantly they, they late end. to send it to the mail. I'm constantly uh, doing a mistake. So I don't know. It, it's probably one list. Uh, um, I don't know how many years it's, it should be, but we are really bad at this. Yeah, we have one one artist. Uh, she's a real artist. She's foreign agent, so she so she always uh, send them to Ministry of Justice their paintings on this uh, spreadsheet of the, where they should uh, mention their expenses, their uh, money, etc. Well, it's it's quite funny. Yeah. It is very powerful. You should yeah, see. Yeah, yeah. So please, please. Hi, uh, my name is Nayan. Uh, I'm also a journalist. I uh, worked in India and then I was in China for like five years, so uh, I can totally get where you're coming from. Uh, so, yeah, uh, thank you so much for the for the for the very powerful presentation. Uh, it was it was amazing to see, and I really uh, commend your courage of doing this and still continue to do this. Uh, so, my I have two questions. One uh, about you know. But you, you spoke about, I think, about the power of propaganda and how powerful it is in, due to resources, access, and, and everything. Uh, my question is, is the power of propaganda or is propaganda clashing with the reality on the ground in any way? Uh, and that may be changing some perceptions of, of Russian citizens. Uh, is it could be a slow process, uh, it may take time, but is it beginning to happen? Do we have signs of those uh, happening? Second question is about, uh, it's it's not really a personal question, but I really want to maybe touch upon it. Uh, I hope, I mean, I'm sure your families are there in Russia. Uh, I hope they are safe. Uh, but my question is, is there any pressure or any influence that the Russian authorities try to, to, to pressurize them or, or try and do some action so that uh, due to the work that you do, uh, because that is one of the pressure points for the Chinese, which is very prominent. So, yeah, that these are my two questions. Thank you. Maybe I'll start with the second question, and Alexander or Ola will answer the first uh, uh, one as well. Bless you. And uh, um, so, you know, uh, right now, they don't uh, do this with the relatives, like only with the very um, uh, famous opposition politics and their families. Uh, but what we know, and uh, uh, for example, in Belarus, uh, it is already very, very common uh, to uh, get to, uh, to parents of people you cannot uh, catch. Uh, because they're already exiled. And there is a joke in uh, Russia and in Belarus that Belarus is already on the like five season of uh, some very, very scary show. And we are just on the third one because like uh, um, a couple of weeks ago, for example, uh, Russian officials arrested three lawyers uh, uh, who defended a uh, Russian oppositional leader in uh, uh, who is in jail uh, right now. And it was like first precedent uh, of uh, arresting lawyers. Like, okay, second one? Okay, second one. Okay, okay. Human, human rights uh, uh, defender from Russia is here. Yes, okay, second time. Anyway, it's not very common. But in Belarus, it's already very common. And now, like, we are uh, getting closer to this. So I'm, like, this also the reason why I'm still uh, uh, reporting to the Ministry of Justice, because uh, it, like, not doing it can lead you to a criminal case. Criminal case can lead uh, you and your, like, apartment and your uh, relatives to be searched. Uh, because like oh, it's 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 already a criminal case. They can like I don't know where they're going to, um, to 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 search for. But anyway, yeah, they can do it. So yeah, even worse. I don't see any reasons why they won't do this. Because they started with, polit uh, with uh, politicians, uh, definitely. Because for them, th their only goal is shut us up. 
so they will use all uh, all definitely all uh, all sources uh, to do this and answer to your first question uh, unfortunately one is very powerful narrative of Putin's propaganda is yes guys we are lying but all others they are lying too you can't trust to anyone and this is where and they have much much more resources on, on doing that even we, if we are telling truth they say oh no it's a bullshit because that 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 and that well well but j just one just one example we we still have as i say guerrilla uh, channel in uh, zen it was yandex zen now it's just zen controlled by also by by, by kremlin uh, and we still have there quite big uh, channel um, not mentioned the moscow times but we publish our our stories and one of uh, of that story recently last week uh, it was just news analysis was was not uh, exclusive uh, 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 story just just good news analysis about putin's visit to to, to china uh, and uh, it had 3,000 views, just normal stories. On our blocked site, 3,000 views. 300,000, or th uh, yes, 300,000 and 3,000. This is the, the well, just one example how uh, that blockage is really uh, works. I think maybe, I'm sorry, uh, I think uh, we have a, uh, an example, for example, even from our podcast uh, last si uh, series, uh, when the brother, one of our sister's brother, came to war and saw it with his own eyes, like it was a disaster. And he was like, um, but still he came from there and was like, yes, Russia is a great country. We s fight. Uh, enemies we fight nazis like he haven't he hasn't seen any nazis there he hasn't seen anything like he saw only like very poor poor conditions like um they, 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 they like the officers they don't care about like them at all they like they had to uh eat like food they can like find around but still like so this uh, narrative is very very strong you can like live in very poor conditions very poor environment but still believe that we are empire and like the greatest country in the world we are fighting uh western world with our bare hands seems like a bit of cognitive dissonance but please go ahead Hi, uh, thanks everyone. Uh, I'm one of uh, Sonia's colleagues on the Neiman Fellowship, so we're, and there's a lot of Neimans here. We're all very proud of you, Sonia, and it's really, um, and it's nice to meet you, Olga, um, from last year. I'm sad that we didn't get to meet in person. Uh, my question is actually for Maxim, and I wanted to just know a little bit more what your experience is being an attorney representing, what is it like to go into court representing people who are charged with, w representing journalists who are charged with different kinds of violations of this law? And are you now practicing in Russia like right now? Thank you so much for this question. So I think that uh, we are kind of appals to journalists, independent journalists, independent lawyers in exile, independent journalists in exile. Well, uh, no, I, um, uh, in fact, I, I left Russia uh, last year, and um, also due to um, this drafting process, mobilization, and also because of my more than 12 years human rights experience in Russia, I uh, represented a lot of uh, NGOs labeled as foreign agents, and it's my specialization, in fact, and now I'm conducting my research in this field comparative analysis of uh, foreign agents legislation in different countries, not only in Russia, but also in uh, Central Asia and in other countries, because dozens of countries today uh, have their own uh, foreign agent legislation. Um, so how it is to, to be a lawyer? It's a quite tough question because, in fact, it's a matter of your own um, of your own vision and um, to some extent I think it's a kind of a mm, I don't know um, it's it's maybe it's a kind of a disease or something to be human rights you know defender or human rights lawyer in or human rights activist in Russia but of course a joke but I think it's a kind of a it's, it's a matter of your own dignity that you cannot be uh, you know uh, cannot 
feel yourself okay when you see uh, injustice and when you when you see uh, that something is wrong with your own country, with your own society, and moreover that someone, uh, for example, was beaten on the street and then also was fined uh, under some administrative uh, article or administrative offense. Anyway, so and it's it's just you cannot go. Uh, go um, uh, not to not not to help this 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 person. So you have to do something with that. Even if you cannot receive positive results for this person, you could be uh, near this person. You could help to this person uh, as much as you can. So and uh, well, sometimes you can do something. Of course, it's it's um, it's hard. To, to reach uh, some some positive results, uh, especially in uh, cases related to foreign agent legislation, because uh, it's just the little statistic, literally little statistic, uh, of positive decisions um, in these cases. Uh, uh, like through all these 10 or even 11 years of legal practice, only two cases and like uh, if some instances were positive. One of this was my case with one of NGO. It's it was first case in 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 Russia last year. Uh, in in appeal, we we won this case and received 26 pages of positive decision of the judge, and we went through three or four trials, uh, three or four hours each, and then Cassation, the next instance, dismissed this judgment in seven or ten minutes. So it's just it's how it works in Russia. So that's why it's really hard to to uh, to answer this question. So what does it mean to be like um, to be a, a human rights defender in, um, in 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 Russia? Again, my answer is like it's the the similar situation to how to be independent journalist in Russia. So it's it's a, I don't know. It's a kind of a habit, maybe a kind of a credo, you know, a credo how to be a for like a human rights defender in Russia. Yeah. There is a heard from my friend uh, friends who are lawyers in Russia that uh, uh, you are more than like a therapist. There, you just you are uh, you, you you just go like to the trial to be there. Just uh, not to leave uh, uh, this person alone against the system, but you already know that you won't change anything. You you already know the decision, the, like. But you uh, but you go there just like to fight for this person, like sh so he or she like th so one can see that he's like someone is fighting for him. Because you have to do that. It's just like yeah. It is. But it's pointless. <laughs> I think we have time for just one last question, if anyone has one question. It's always blue. Thank you very much. I'm with the Neiman crowd. Um, Sonia, you said that Olga had really good access to the Duma before all this went down. And um, Maxim, you talk about the apathy of the people on the street. but inside the government you had good access and then can you give us a sense of how that shut down whether there's any you know is it fear inside the government is it loyalty is there apathy um just some context there for us would be wonderful thank you yeah uh it could be a whole article about this and it's constantly constantly news about how they react on what's going on uh, on, on 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 the war or inside and at first um i remember that uh a lot of my sources were shocked uh and uh, or at least they pretend that they're shocked uh let's put it this way um, but I also remember that how fast they uh, like started to think differently. They started to be in the same uh, general line, you know what I mean? Like, uh, okay, now we are like in the middle of the war. Okay, uh, it's a crazy uh, thing to do, but we are already in this basket. So we, we could not like ex escape any anywhere. And uh, all of my sources, they uh, mostly were mm, connected to uh, more domestic politics, more 
uh, legislation or laws or so on. And uh, there is a lot of rumors that all decisions made by one person, you know, that uh, probably or you probably heard that said that the, all of these decisions they made by the party of KJ, KJB and FSB guys. Uh, and this also kind of, uh, I had this sense that that's, uh, they couldn't change anything. Even they really uh, also think that it's a crazy thing to do. They couldn't change uh, the minds of uh, those people uh, who decided to do this. Uh, and uh, speaking of what's happened after they banned me and they put me to this uh, list, uh, of course, it's influenced all work because uh, it was my specialization. And after you're a foreign agent, people just don't want to talk with you. Uh, so I had like a whole, uh, like a let's 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 say map of sources, uh, and this in Kremlin and Duma and. Uh, uh, more than half of these sources just like cut me down after I was put it in this list. Uh, so that, that's also a reason why I decided, okay, that it's not the time to do write about politics because there is no politics. Like there is no, like there is nothing to discuss inside. I mean, there is a, some game or sort of game, but it's pointless. It's just like, yeah, we agree with everything that they say to do to us. Mm -hmm. So now I'm still having like some, uh, I'm still have some sources who are speaking and it's, uh, of course, uh, it's just, uh, it's not the same at all as it was. I, I hope I, I get your question right. I'm sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm really sleepy. <laughs> Well, hopefully, Olga, we can now give you some time to get some rest. And that is all the time we have left. Thank you to our distinguished speakers for sharing their stories with us. And thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. Uh, it was such a pleasure. And we hope to see you again sometime here at Fletcher. Thank you. Yeah, so the lecture will be edited and then published it in our website, but also we will share it with Fletcher, so you can <laughs> watch it again. Watch it. Yes, you can watch it yes, again. Of course. Thank you very much. Do conspects, you know. Thank you so much for coming. Have a good night. Yeah.